All right, KISS Army, welcome to the KISS FAQ podcast. Thank you for letting us into your head. I hope we don't do any damage. This is a KISS-related podcast by the board for the board. We hope you enjoy. Welcome to episode 15 of the KISS FAQ podcast. Um, thank you, everyone, to listening to our last episode. Um, hope you enjoyed it and that you're going to enjoy today's. Joining me today are Lonnie. And returning to the show for the first time in a while, Sean, welcome back. Good to have you again. Thank you. Our topic today is pretty straightforward. We're going to dig into some of the post-reunion solo albums that uh, Gene, Paul, Ace, and Peter have put out in the years, I guess, since uh, Ace left the band in 2002. And, you know, we might as well just kick straight into this wonderful piece of art. (laughs) Gene Simmons, and my version is the Asterix Hall. Um, but of course, there's there's much more to this album. Released in 2004 on Sanctuary, I think it was uh, the second the second album they put out on that label following Kiss Symphony. Um, Sean, let's start with you. What were your impressions, your reactions, your high points and low points of Asshole? Well, I didn't hear the album when it came out, because I guess I just wasn't aware of it. I didn't hear it until much later. Um, my impression of it was kind of weird because my mom bought it for me on iTunes and then burned it onto a CD, but she didn't put it into the correct track order. She put all the songs in alphabetical order. Ooh. And so that's how I always heard the album. And so today was the first time I actually listened to it in the correct order. And I certainly do like some of the songs, but listening to it today and maybe it's just because I'm not used to it but I don't really understand <laughs> why certain things are put in a certain spot or why certain choices are made it's a it's an interesting album but also very uh, baffling you know Gene's and a guy Gene's a guy who says that he doesn't like wearing a tie suit or any of that and here he is on the number one album cover you know, if you if you don't get past the packaging he doesn't look like Gene on that album at all before you even get into the music. Um, I can't think of how painful it is listening to it in alphabetical order, by the way. That's, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about that right now, and that does not sound pleasant. Um, but kicks off with Sweet and Dirty Love. What do you think? That, I mean, that, that song's got a lot of kiss history. What, what do you guys think are, you know, like standout tracks here? Lonnie? Sweet Dirty Love is a good is a good track on there, um, and there's a there's a couple on there. Weapons of Mass Destruction isn't bad, but my whole problem with it is the production on that album. I mean, it's just awful. I mean, it sounds like it was recorded in a tin can, and I mean, the, the album itself to me just sounds like it feels like it was. Like, he got the idea on a Sunday, hey, why don't I do a, why don't I do a solo album? So he thought of it on Sunday, recorded it on Monday, and put it out on Tuesday. It's, it's almost what it sounds like. It, it, it's just, here, throw these songs and put them on an album, and I'll put out a solo album, and I'm going to call it, I got a great idea, I'm going to call it Asshole, just to be Gene Simmons. And it, you know, when it came out, it was like, they like tied it into like the pilot almost, I think of like family jewels or like a, a lead into what family jewels could be or something. There was like this special on VH one and he's going out to like the release party of it. And Sophie and Nick are there and they say, Oh, have fun at your asshole party. And he's handing out these cards that say asshole on it. And he's just playing off the whole shtick of the album. And it, I remember the day it came out, it came out the same day as, um, Velvet Revolver's album, and I went and bought both the albums that morning, and I had a good idea what the Gene Simmons solo album was going to be like, because I had heard about it two weeks before it came out, or something like that, and I just just had a good I had a premonition of what it was going to be, and I put in the Velvet Revolver album first, and listened to that first over the Gene Simmons album, even as big of a Kiss fan that I am, because I I just had a good feeling that it was just going to be a pile of crap, and to me, that's that's what it is. But Sweet Dirty Love, there's a, there's some demos of that out that are that are good that I think it could have, if recorded properly or had better production, it could have been a, a much better track. Um, but it, it just, the album itself just 
just doesn't do it for me at all. Sean, coming back to you on this, what what um, what are your standouts on this album? The tracks are there any that grab you, or are there any that really hurt you? Um, in terms of ones that I really like, um, I do like "Sweet and Dirty Love." I like that riff. I like a lot of Bruce's guitar on it. Um, the Carnival of Souls track I think is pretty cool. I, I really like the background vocals on that. Um, I think certain songs have potential. Like I think "Now That You're Gone" could have been really good. I just think there's a little too much going on on that song and several others where I think if they had been stripped back a lot more, they might've been more interesting. And then there are a lot of songs that just have really just out there lyrics that make the songs just hard to listen to, like black, to black tongue and dog. And if I had a gun that are interesting ideas for songs, but just really bizarre lyrically and just hard to listen to. And the last one you mentioned there is one of the songs I kind of ha have a whole problem with this album with. I was expecting, hoping for something eclectic, um, like his 1978 album had been. Um, and I guess we get that, but we get too many songs that are either covers or songs that have been purchased from other artists. Firestarter, obviously big hit in the UK. I don't know how, how it was here in America. Um, in the 90s for uh, Prodigy. Waiting for the Morning Light, yeah, well, that's a co-write. Um, but Beautiful, that he purchased that. You know, that's, that's a cover. Um, Black Tongue, that's a cover. And, and it's just like, it, Carnival of Souls is a recycle from 95. Weapons of Mass Destruction is a recycle. Sweet and Dirty is a recycle. Now That You're Gone is a recycle. So you either got purchased songs, and Bag, of course, was the writer of If I Had a Gun, because that, that's way out there, and Dog. Um, just, it strikes me as being so lazy. So, Lonnie, you say that, you know, I'm going to make a solo album on Saturday, go into the studio on Sunday. I think it's more like, I'm going to make a solo album. On Sunday, he calls a bunch of people. You got any stuff I can use? Um, what's, I, hey, I heard your song, uh, you know, 50 Bucks. And Asshole, of course. You know, that was by one of the Scandinavian bands. Um, so it's unoriginal. It's not really Gene. When he's got so much good stuff, or think, stuff that I think is good, in the can for him to go out and buy all this stuff to kind of, kind of be, like, trendy... I mean, whatever turns you on, we, we've heard the story of how he approached that songwriter or guitarist to get that track. Um, so it's not like 78, where you get his eclectic, you know, writing styles. Lonnie, thoughts on that? No, I mean, there's there's no, like, Beatlesque. I guess Dream of Thousand Dreams might be the most, maybe a hint towards 78 that you could, that almost could tie into that 78 album. I mean, if he had more songs like that, or... There's some songs um, when he released the um, um, Gene Simmons' Sex Money Kiss that came like in a lunchbox. It had a CD in it that mm -hmm. had a couple of demos on there. Songs like and, and that wasn't bad. I mean, songs like that could have fit on there a lot more with, with some better production to be more like his 78 album. I'm not, I'm not saying that he needs to recreate the 78 album because it's a masterpiece or anything like that, but... There, he has songs, and he says, oh, oh yeah, I'm going to release this Gene Simmons monster box set worth of demos, you know, 100 demos. What, well, use some of those songs and and put some good production on them and maybe get a few you know guests guest spots on there like he did in 78. And he could have made something a, much stronger than what he just lazily came out with. Um, it, it just doesn't... It, it, it doesn't fit Gene. I mean, the whole... For what we think of Gene, what the public thinks of Gene, and you see the album cover with him in a suit, like you were saying, and and the songs that are on it, it just it just doesn't work for me as a Kiss fan. Doesn't work for me as a Gene Simmons fan. It, it's just it's just not there. And it, and it, Gene has so many songs out there that it could have been so much better than than what he per, than what he put out there for us. Sean. Well, it seems to go against a lot of what he likes to say. One of the things he loves to brag about is how they write their own songs in Kiss. Like, it's them, there are no guest stars. But when he goes to do an album, it's not a whole lot of him. 
gets a lot of other bizarre songs that he heard and just liked, I guess. Yeah, I think Lonnie brought up a great point about the Sex Money Kiss uh, bonus EP. Um, I actually still have that. But that's Everybody Knows and You're My Reason for Living. And, yeah. th and those were included on the Japanese version of Asshole as their bonus tracks. And I think they're slightly different versions than the ones on the Sex Money Kiss. But those are absolutely outstanding songs, which for me fit far more in with where I see Gene as you know, a solo songwriter rather than writing to be a demon or writing for the confines of Kiss or maybe writing to meet Paul's requirements for the confines of Kiss, however you want to look at it that way. Um, I mean, if I had to pick three songs off this album and say, okay, I, I can live with these, I'll go with Sweet and Dirty. Uh, Weapons of Mass Destruction, I actually really like. It's so odd. It's so discordant for me. Um, and it's got lyrics that go back to 1971 that he's recycled into it. Um, so from that point of view, I really, I really love that song. And you know, I, I'm having a, a difficult time figuring <laughs> out a third one here. Um, you know, I, I think I'll throw in "Waiting for the Morning Light" just because it's Bob Dylan and it's just so unusual. So those would be like my three picks. The rest of it, I could flush without. Uh, without doubt, and I didn't include the two Japanese uh, tracks on there in uh, in flushing them because they're obviously better than anything else. Pick pick your three, Sean. You got you got to live with these forever, or at least uh, until tomorrow. I would <laughs> I would go with Sweet and Dirty Love as well, along with uh, Carnival of Souls, and I would actually pick the title track. While that does have really bizarre lyrics like the rest of the album. I think it works a bit more in that song than some of the other ones. Lonnie, three picks. I'd say, I'd say Sweet Dirty Love, Weapons of Mass Destruction, and uh, A Thousand Dreams. And if I never heard any of the other ten songs again, I would be fine with that. <laughs> What about the video to Firestarter? Well, didn't he didn't he shoot one dressed up as a pimp with yeah, lots of Hollywood, it's, which was it's, totally fake and just oh. it's kind of disturbing to watch. Right? Yeah, disturb <laughs> disturbing is the one word there that sums that up. Sean, you ever see that video? Uh, yeah, I remember it vaguely. I remember like a big like yellow Humvee just sort of going up and down. <laughs> yeah, the yeah. <laughs> All right, let, let's close out. Also, I just want to mention a couple of collectibles out there. Um, there is a five-track EP uh, with advanced mixes of Carnival of Souls and one of the other songs on it. Uh, let's see, Waiting for the Morning Light, slightly different uh, mixes. So he's done it in Pro Tools and moved things around a little bit. So that's a cool one worth picking up. There's also an asshole promo CD for the song that's got the sheep edit, which I always found hilarious. Um, <laughs> I can't imagine any radio station actually playing that song and wanting the asshole word bleeped out with sheep sounds. Um, but, <laughs> you know, there you go. And, of course, as Lonnie mentioned, the uh, Sex Money Kiss is... You can probably find that uh, lunchbox now for about $3. And, yeah, and I it, find it on eBay for cheap. Yeah, so, you know, it's got that bonus uh, CD in it. All right, let's move on a couple years. So, Gene puts this out in 2004... Um, it's a pretty quiet time for the band in 2005, 2006, and Paul Stanley decides to get in on the action. that He'd been talking about doing another solo album for quite a while. And he takes an interesting approach with, you know, let's hold this one up. Live to win. Winning. Sounds like Charlie Sheen. Um, so this comes out in 2006, and he signed up to Universal. Uh, so... Paul is not going to be on Sanctuary or any podunk label. Sean, how did you receive Live to Win? What were your initial impressions of it? Uh, I actually really, really loved Live to Win when it came out. I don't know if it was just the right time, because there was a lot of, of stuff coming out of Kiss at that time, like Kissology, and maybe I was just on a high, but I really loved it. It was one of my favorite uh, Kiss-related things for a while. Yeah, 2006, KISS is probably at its lowest point in this century. They, they, 
they don't do very many shows at all. I, they hit Japan in 2006. They did a casino show, uh, a couple of casino shows here, but I, I don't remember much. But we're being spoiled with products. We've got Kissology, and this album drops. I just remember being excited to see what Paul was going to do. I was hoping for, again, like I did with Gene, for an album that kind of had parallels with 1978. So beautiful guitar tones is what I was hoping for. Um because of how his 78 so loud. Lonnie, what were your hopes? Um, I was hoping for something similar to 78, obviously, because that's, that's just one incredible album. Um, and what we got is a little different than <laughs> what my expectations were. Um, but I enjoy it. Um, I enjoyed it at the time, and I still like the album. I, I really like the title track. Um, and it's probably the one song that would maybe fit into a Kiss album or a Kiss show. Um, but and, and I I listen I, I run to that track all the time. It's a it's a good fire fiery up type song. Um, and the rest of it is a lot of you know there's there's the ballads on there and a lot of stuff that that wouldn't fit in the Kiss. And it seems that some of those songs might have been song ideas that he had had for a while um like second to none is obviously about about a second wife Aaron and there's 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 some decent tracks on there and, and and I like it I like um every time I see you around that's not a bad that's not a bad song you lift I enjoy that too um I enjoyed it at the time and I, I still enjoy it now it's it's different it's not what you would expect from from you know, rock star supreme Paul Stanley, and it's it's not what he delivered in '78, but um, the product it's it's, it's very it's very produced, um, but and, it, and it's short. It's only like a, it's only like like a half hour, maybe a little bit over a half hour long. The songs are fairly fairly simple and fairly direct and to the point, but but I I enjoy it. It's not guitar driven like I would have liked, but. I really liked it at the time. I went and saw him in Chicago on the tour and, and really enjoyed it. Yeah, Sean? But um, in terms of what I think of it now, um, I still really, really like it. Um, some of the songs really stand out to me, like Lift to Win and Lift are the two highlights. Um, the big criticism I have of it is sort of the Aerosmith problem, which is that there are just a lot of ballads and there doesn't need to be. Like, I think I like Second to None and I think Loving You Without You Now. And then every time I see you around, I like those songs, but there's no reason for all three of them to be on one album. Yeah, when, when your album's under half an hour and, you know, it's three bells. 15 minutes of it is uh, syrup, it gets a little bit sickly sweet. And two of them are pretty much the same song. Um, every time I see you around and Loving You Without You Now are pretty much about the exact same thing. So there's no reason for both of them to be on there. You should have just picked one. Yeah, loving you without you now. I mean, apart from being an uncomfortable title, I, that doesn't make any sense. I can't <laughs> stand. Um, that's got to be one of the worst Paul Stanley songs in his catalog for me. Um, but Live to Win, great catchy, anthemic sort of thing that obviously Kiss loves. Lift, I liked. Wake Up Screaming, fantastic. You know, So your first three songs, Bulletproof, and not so much. All About You, no. Second to None, not at all. Um, it's Not Me, I liked. And, I mean, that's Holly Knight and uh, Charlie Midnight back in the scene. And Where Angels Dare. I think that last one takes quite a bit of heat for it kind of being new metal, you know, new all that sort of like modern rock at the time. But... Where I can't get into any of that other stuff, I you know, Where Angels Dare was a pretty decent song. But the ballads, they just put me off. And I, it's the sound of the album. So same problem as Gene producing his album, is Paul producing his. That it's thin, um, maybe he was trying to just sound modern and all that, but with, with Bruce playing bass on tracks, I think I'd rather have Bruce on guitar on some of them and, uh, you know, just let it scream. You know, and that's not really to put down, you know, Brad and Tommy and John Five, who you know do most of the guitar work. But I think Bruce 
could have given it a little bit more life and vibe. Yeah, I agree. I I wish that you would let just Bruce be Bruce on that album and give it some just give it some more style and more of a just a, a heavier feel with with uh, Bruce's playing as opposed to the direction that he took. And, um, and for that matter too, it would have been co- and and I and I understand why. Maybe I don't understand why. As far as like the touring band that he that he took out for that, it would have been cool to have more of a maybe not a studded lineup, but it would have been cool to have Bruce up there. And I know maybe probably the reason why he didn't is because he didn't want it to be like half of the Revenge lineup with Bruce up there. But I think you know it could have been cool to have to have him up there. He played Hydra Heart on that tour. If you could have Bruce on there, and I, I just think it would have been. A little better than getting a band off a TV show to go on tour with you. But I think he did that deliberately, you know. No, yeah, and he did do that deliberately. Just, just he for the a band just, that was tight. That yeah, knew each other and the press because Rockstar was massive on TV was back then. The time, so sure. it was a way of tying his name to something, um, something that wasn't non-kiss. So you know, mm-hmm. I don't think it worked because no. it's not like the audiences were very big on that tour. I loved the show I went to, and I will say. Seeing live a million to one, Magic Touch. You know, awesome. forget the songs on the album that that he was supporting. It was uh, the performance of those two songs with the the standouts. Sean, do you see any of the tour, or have you seen any of the uh, the bootlegs? Obviously, this came out as One Live Kiss um, a few years later. I'm on One Live Kiss. <laughs> you you in the audience? Yeah. Awesome. I was there in Chicago that night. Like, right, I forgot to choose. Like, the camera goes right on me. It's funny. <laughs> Yeah, all I've seen is the the DVD. I don't think he came anywhere close that I would have been able to see him. But yeah, I really like the DVD. And I do like that band a lot, particularly um, the drummer. Oh, he was he was a monster. Who was that? Nate Morton, fantastic drummer. But yeah, the show had a really good set list, and I like the way that DVD is shot. Just personally, I think it's one of the better looking videos that have come out of. Kiss related things. Yeah, that's a really good point because it is an absolutely beautifully filmed um, show. And I'm just looking here. It's, uh, is it Louis Antonelli? Louis Antonelli. Yeah, yeah what a fantastic uh, job. And he originally had a plan of doing like a documentary mm-hmm. um, part, which we still haven't seen. So I've seen it. Cause you they have. Did, like, they did a release party for One Live Kiss in Chicago, which is where Louis is from, and they showed it. They said this isn't going to be on the DVD, but they had clearance like to show it that day, and it was it was really cool. And it's like a lot of like one on one with Paul talking about you know just typical Paul Stanley stuff like going for your dreams and you know achieving and climbing the mountain type stuff. But and they had a lot of backstage footage from that show and um, some sound checks type stuff. And it, Paul talks about his relationship with Louis Antonelli, how he met Louis in Chicago, like in 74, um, Kiss did a signing. And Louis talks about meeting Paul, and Paul telling him to, even back then in 74, to, to always, you know, give a 100% and to, you know, just follow your dreams no matter what. And Louis talks about how that's something that, that stuck with him and to be able to shoot Paul you know, 30 years later at the time, you know, just really meant the world to him and how Paul's advice really carried him through life. And it's, it's a really cool, it's a really cool documentary. I mean, I only saw it the one time, obviously that they, that they showed it in Chicago. Um, and it's, it's a shame. And, and I guess there, it's a shame it didn't wind up on there. I'm, I think there's some, some kind of legal reasons why it didn't end up on the, the DVD itself. And I think that, it delayed the, the release of that DVD for a couple of years. Like it was, obviously, it was shot in the fall of 06, and it didn't come out till I want to say, 08. It was a couple of years later. Yeah, I, it was right at the end of the, uh, the whole Kissology cycle, October 2008 mm-hmm. when the DVD came out. So, you know what? They've just done the Blu-ray of Detroit Rock City. I'm really surprised this has not been a Blu-ray yet with how high-res the, the, the film seems to be. It, it seems agree. like a perfect one to actually throw out there on a Blu-ray. Um, we know it, it didn't sell massively, unfortunately, but it's it's really one of the best post Kiss projects. I you know even above Live to Win is one live Kiss for me. 
you know, I, I bought the standalone digital download of the thing, you know, because it's basically been turned into an album by being made available audio only on Amazon and iTunes. Uh -huh. um, so I listen to that regularly as one of my go-to, you know, just kind of light, light days away from, you know, the bootlegs. Right. It's shot very, it, it's really shot fantastic. I mean, it really gives you the sense like you're in the audience almost the way, the way that thing's shot. Um, and like the focus on like Paul's guitar playing and, um, and like in just, just the way it's shot in general, it's just, it was, it was really amazing. Um, all right. So let's wrap up, uh, live to win. I, I think it was, you know, pretty good effort by Paul, a little bit too much attempt to be modern and relevant and stepping outside what I hoped, but the, the real winner in this whole album for me is the video so one life kiss if you guys ever listen out there uh get it out on blu-ray and uh put on uh, the documentary as well as a, a bonus feature because obviously it sounds like it would be a really interesting watch from that high point we move on we go from the beauty and wonderful quality of one life kiss into peter chris one for all. And we, we talked about this in a previous episode, uh, and we really dug into it. So I, I really think we'll get your, your guys' opinion on it quickly and try and get through this as quickly as possible. Um, Sean, one for all. Um, today was the first time I've listened to it in a long time. I'm sorry. I, I, <laughs> <laughs> um, probably the only, maybe the second time I've actually listened to the whole way through and yeah the only thing I can think of while I was listening to it is um I work at uh, Walgreens part-time to help pay for school and we a lot of the music that's played over like the intercom is like cheesy <laughs> 90s easy listening music and I just thought most of the album would just fit right in there <laughs> and, yeah it's not very impressive I don't think it really showcases Peter's abilities that well, either as a singer or a drummer. I don't think he put emphasis in the right areas for his skill set, and a lot of it just comes off as really weak for me anyway. Yeah, and, and that, that essentially was what I, and I guess the whole panel thought when we talked about it as part of uh, Peter's you know dedicated music episode, that it's just weak across um, and out of key. The material... It may mean a lot to Peter, but that didn't translate into meaning anything to me. So there, there's a couple of songs on there that I do like. I will, you know, What a Difference a Day Makes is obviously an ancient cover, but I really dig that, you know, performance and Faces in the Crowd. And that's all, all I can say. The rest of it doesn't do a thing for me. I went to try and find my CD this morning, and I don't even still have one. Uh <laughs> You know, I, I, I had a signed copy and I must have flogged it on eBay or in some auction to, uh, you know, get $9 back for it. Um, Lonnie? It's, I know I talked about this on a previous episode, but it is, it's not good, to put it bluntly. It's, it's and, I'm, and Sean, I'm sorry, I, I don't think it fits in well with anything, <laughs> even in Walgreens background music. It's, it's a, it's a, it's a mess, and it's it's a shame that this might be the last release we get from Peter Chris because it just it just leaves a bad taste in your mouth listening to it, and it's just like, what were you thinking? And he loves it, and there's interviews with him like in his in, like in his book, he talks about how he was so disappointed that, and he didn't understand why it didn't get received better. It's like, Peter, you're you're not listening to it. And, People around you are giving. I think, and I and I, and I said this the last time we talked about it too. I think people around him were giving him bad advice and are just being yes men to him because they know that Peter will fly off the handle and he he needed he and he it just lacked direction and um, lacked a good producer to to make it into something that it could have been better to make it better and what came out is just is just a mess and it's it's a shame. Which would you rather listen to for eternity? One for all or asshole? <laughs> you know you're sp you know where you're spending eternity if you have to listen to one of those for eternity. <laughs> <laughs> True. So 
So he swung and he misses for most people, I think, with that element. And rather than dwelling on, you know, I guess what would turn into bashing Peter, you know, for his effort, he, he put his heart out there, but it just doesn't resonate. Um, so let's quickly move on to Ace. And I don't, I got to look at the date this came out. I'm disappointed after all those years in the 1990s of saying the new albums, you know, be out in the spring, It'll be out in the spring. It'd be out in the spring. He puts it out in the freaking fall. Right around the same time as a Kiss album. So, you know, smart to kind of tag up on that. And it became, you know, his his uh, top charting album, really. So, Anomaly, Ace Frehley, Back in the Groove. Um, I mean, I, I love this album from start to finish. And there's maybe one or two tracks which, you know, are stinkers. But Foxy and Free, really cool vibe. Outer Space, the video, the single. Um... You know, he may have bought that song, but it, it's better than a lot of the stuff he's done. Pain in the Neck, Fox on the Run, Genghis Khan, absolute monstrous. You know, what a that's almost Spinal Tap-ish, 800 guitar tracks. I mean, obviously I'm exaggerating, but, you know, when he was talking about that, he, was like, he, he sounded like Nigel talking about his amp going up to 11. Yeah, but this has 100, <laughs> 126 tracks on this song. Um, my personal favorite on this album, Too Many Faces. You know, I, I just like the style, his vocal delivery, and the guitars, the guitars, it's just everywhere. The downside is the production for me, and that's been kind of a weak, a weak part. It just doesn't sound unified across the board. Sean, what about you on Anomaly? Uh, I really like Anomaly. I think it succeeds in a way that Asshole uh, doesn't enter the ace, tries to do kind of a mix of different things. I think he's able to do it in a way that is still consistent and it doesn't feel like kind of a whiplash effect like Asshole does. Yeah, you can listen to it more than once, can't you? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Um, There's a lot of cool tracks there. You know, big rockers like Outer Space and Foxy and Free, but there's also stuff that's really different from what Ace normally normally does. Like It's a Great Life and Genghis Khan. Those are two of the standout tracks for me. Um, my favorite track is uh, the cover of Fox on the Run, but maybe that's just because that's a cover I always wanted him to do, and I just really like that song. Um, the only downside for the album would be that weird cardboard packaging with the pyramid. I never got that. <laughs> you held up a, a jewel case, and I didn't realize they made those. Oh, yeah. The, the, this is a European release, so uh, most of the time I'll either buy European or Japanese to get away from these damned digipacks which i despise um especially when all my cds go way back but you you mentioned fox on the run and i like the suite and i always wanted ace to cover the suite and i hate his cover it just (laughs) it it does nothing i was so disappointed by it and i was so keyed up to hear it i thought he was gonna knock it out of the woods like like he had into the night and do you thought it would just suit him Nah, falls completely flat for me um and i do want to bash one song a little below the angels. I freaking hate. That's like a 2009 version of Dolls for me, which is one of, one of my hates as well. Lonnie. Um, I was really, really pleased with this album when it came out and coming out in fall of 09, you know, right when Sonic Boom did. It was just, it was great to get a Kiss album, which you hadn't gotten in since 98, and to get an Ace Frehley album that you hadn't gotten since 90. I don't even know. Remember when? Eighteen thirty. <laughs> but it was great. It was a great time to be a fan. You got both those albums at the same time, almost. And I remember listening back and forth between the two of them, and which I'm sure a lot of fans did. And Foxy and Free, you're saying it's great. And Outer Space, and I know people. Some people said they really don't like it. I really like that song. I think that song's. And it, obviously, he didn't write it, but. It is. It just. It just fit for me. I think. I think outer space is. It's just a great. It's a great tune. Great tune that. You know, I, I thought it would get more attention than it did. Honestly, um, pain in the neck is great. Sister, it was nice to hear a, a nice version of Sister after hearing the demo of it for so long. And I, I thoroughly enjoyed the album. Genghis Khan, I mean, it's a great one too. But the. Uh, it could have been better produced, but it's it was for me. It's it's maybe maybe the best of these albums that we're talking about. 
it's maybe my favorite and probably the one I listen to the most out of any of them and I was really happy with it then I was happy with it now I'm happy with it now and um unfortunately he didn't tour much for it I mean he did that solo tour like a year before it came out and then did a few scattered dates for that I mean shows on the east coast and a few scattered dates in the midwest and that was it and I was really disappointed for that I was really hoping for more of a uh more of a showing from him on the touring front after the album came out to support it, but that's ace for you sometimes. But I enjoyed it. Um, still do to this day. One of my favorites. I think the artwork's right up there in terms of quality with One for All, unfortunately. The, that's true. The, the morphing, I get the idea, but it doesn't work. And he rectifies that on the next, on the next album. But my one complaint with the album is Sister. I really, really, really think Richie Scarlet should have been a guest on that one since it had been part of that lineup's um, set for so long, so I was a little disappointed. I think he was also taking off the the songwriting credit on that. Um, but, you know, Richie's obviously back with him now, so hopefully all's good. And you you got to give a shout-out to Frank Munoz doing a great job corralling Ace um, in this period. I mean, this album would not have happened without Frank. And, you know... What a what a great job to finally have gotten Ace to complete an album. I remember meeting Ace in a San Francisco radio station when he was out here promoting it, you know, and, and he was just really happy. You know, he was he was enjoying it. Um, he was proud to have the album back out. So, you know, it, it's a fun fun thing to look back on. Two thousand and nine, when we were getting Kiss albums and Ace albums at the same time, I mean, it was like nineteen eighty seven all over again. So, let's move on to well. The Return of the Space Bear. Oh god, the bonus track on Anomaly, which was, uh, I think, only on the iTunes. So he revisits his uh, legendary Tom Snyder commentary. That's kind of that's kind of fun. But let's move on. Space Invader. And here's another non-digipack. Uh, <laughs> Japan. So, that's obviously very new. And that's current, most current release of all these guys is Space Invader, which I think... Number one, he deals with the artwork issue. It goes and gets Ken Kelly to do something, and there he is in silhouette in all his 1977 glory, you know, standing on the steps to a spaceship. So I like the art. Absolutely. It's Fantastic. It's, it's nice and dumb and simple and well executed. Uh, musically, the album, I think, is the strongest post-Kiss release of anyone um, by far. I absolutely love, still listen to on a regular basis. Everything on this album is fantastic, with the exception of the the Joker, which you know it's the second album in a row that his covers fallen flat for me. Um, and I always look forward to what he does because he he picks some good covers. But where I say the production wasn't that good on Anomaly, there's so much more guitar layering on this album. It's got so much more depth, so much more vibrancy. Um, even though a couple of the songs aren't necessarily as good as the material on Anomaly, they sound better. So. Sean, what was your take on Space Invader? Um, I actually didn't really like Space Invader that much. Um, I don't know, it's a weird album because I don't have a whole lot of bad to say about it, but I don't have a lot of good to say either. Um, to me, it's just something that kind of exists. I sort of forget the songs as soon as I hear them, and it just doesn't do anything for me. Uh, there are a couple songs I think are catchy. Um... I really liked uh, Past the Milky Way, but other than that, the album just just sort of flat to me. Lonnie? I really enjoy this one as well. Um, I Want to Hold You is a really standout track for me on the, on the album. It's catchy. It's got a great feel to it. Space Invader, give me a feeling. I think it's, it's a great album, and it, it really showcases Ace... Um, with the guitar work, like you were saying, is is, is really good, and the production is, is better than Anomaly. Um, I think I like I think I like Anomaly as an album a little better, but it's I I really enjoyed it and still listen to it quite. I mean, it's fairly new, but I still listen to it quite a bit. And I will agree with you on the Joker. It was it didn't. I was really kind of skeptical at first when I heard that he was going to be covering it, and then when I heard it, I was like, yeah, I was, 
think I was right on on that. It was not a good choice, and kind of makes me a little curious and a little leery of what this cover album that he's putting out is going to sound like after the two covers that he's put out since with Anomaly and Space Invader. What this is going to sound like? He, I hope he, I hope he nails it, and it's more like on the long lines of like Duya was, but the Joker just didn't do anything for me. But the uh, guitar work on the album is great. Production on it is fantastic. Also, I, I really, I really enjoy this one. Also, he just seems to, that he has so much more clarity on this album. You know, maybe, maybe the years of getting over his his addictions, you know, maybe settling down. I mean, he, he's got several collaborations with his fiance Rachel Gordon on this, and you know, I was worried about that. Because when you kind of mix business with, you know, personal stuff, I was like, oh, God, here we go. It's going to be, you know, like Rick Allen of Def Leppard's uh, album that he did with his wife. I, I was just worried that it wasn't going to work. And he purchased some songs again, you know, Pass the Milky Way is a cover. You know, that, that's, he's rewritten that um, originally by Chris Casson, the, the, uh, the, obviously the co-writer. And that's up on uh, YouTube, so you can go catch out that original version. And I was really worried when... I first heard Give Me a Feeling, uh, you know, as a single, I was like, oh, oh, you know, it, it was kind of poppy and not very ace. So I was so, so happy with, you know, heavy songs. Um, Space Invader, great song. Toys, he's performing that live on tour yeah. at the moment in Australia. Or he was in New Zealand today. Um, you know, Pass the Milky Way is a really groovy, you know, groove-driven piece. Um, Reckless, good song. But my pick on this album is actually uh, Inside the Vortex. You know, it, it just changes direction so much. So, love the album. And I look forward to this uh, this covers album. It's a two two album deal that he signed with these guys. And hopefully he'll be working on that when he gets back from tour. Um all right, let's continue. Um, so that's basically the core of the post uh, the the post reunion solo albums. Hopefully, Gene's gonna pull his thumb out and do another solo album, or awesome. or give us or give us his box set. Give us that box set. That'd be cool. Paul has mentioned in an interview over the last couple of years he wants to do another, but I don't see that happening. I don't worry about that. Um, one of the other great kind of recent solo albums is. Here's a digi pack. Um, Bruce BK3. Really, again, powerful album. Extremely good guitar work. Kind of reminds me of uh, Revenge in Errors. Um, he's got a lot of guests on this. Um, Eric Singer on I'm the Animal. And Gene on uh, Ain't Gonna Die. So, BK3, guys. Sean, what do you... You got it? You like it? You hate it? Yeah, I really like this album. Um, I think it's a, a big improvement over the first two albums he did, though I did somewhat enjoy those. But, yeah, I really like the material. I really like the guest stars, particularly um, I'm the Animal, since I'm a big fan of uh, that project. Is it pronounced Avantasia? That singer and Bruce were part of with Tobias? Yeah, that's a, that's a good enough pronunciation for me. <laughs> okay, but yeah, I, re I really like what I heard of that. And so hearing uh, that singer on "I'm the Animal" was cool. I really like Gene's track. Um, really like uh, the John Karabi track. Uh, uh, Fate's probably the big standout in terms of a favorite song. Yeah, I gotta say, getting John Karabi back, love his voice. Absolutely. Yeah. I would, I would I would pay for a reunion any day. I'm sure that I'd be with six other guys in the audience. <laughs> you know, it's, it's such a shame. Those guys had such chemistry and worked together. They seemed to work together really well with Union. So um, what do you think about having Nick Simmons as a guest on a Kiss-related album, Lonnie? <laughs> that was a strange choice. Um, yeah, I remember when it came, it came out like in January, February like of 10, right off right after Sonic Boom and, and Anomaly. And, and um, Family Jewels was still fairly big at the time, so I can kind of see why he did that. Kind of, it kind of, maybe maybe it was a little 
production or a little promotion type of thing to put Nick on there. Um, that was an odd choice for me, but uh, I enjoyed the album very much so. Um, it's definitely Bruce's best solo album, much better than Audio Dog and, and Transformer. But, like, Ain't Gonna Die is good, and Dirty Girl, and I'm an Animal are really good songs. And Bruce took a lot of time producing this. It took a lot of time for this album to come out because Bruce really wanted it to be, to be right. And I think he, he was heavily involved in, in the production of it. And what, com- what comes out is is fantastic. I, I thoroughly, thoroughly enjoy this album. Um, start, almost start to finish. Um, there's a few clunkers in there, but, um, for the most part, some really standout tracks. I, I can't say enough good things about it really. Yeah. And I'm not bagging on Nick being on the album. Um, I think hand of the King is actually a pretty reasonable track. Um, I just didn't think he had earned his place yet on a, you know, a high level release. Um, but the standout track for me ain't going to die. Gene Simmons, you know, it, it reunited with Bruce, and just there's a jewel case version. Wow, found in a st- <laughs> four, four bucks. Uh, but for anyone who who uh, has not or is really into this album, go over to Bruce's website now. I don't know if copies are still available, but he's just done a limited run of uh, the album on vinyl. So 500 copies. I've got my little post office delivery note to go down there, and hopefully it's uh, in in the mail today. Um, so get on over there. It's a pretty decent price and being that limited, you know, really good album. So Bruce, and I mean, he teamed up with Jeremy, uh, Rubolino and I probably just butchered his name, but whatever. Um, I, I think when Bruce has someone working with him again as an external filter and Jeremy's a musician in his own right, um, as well as re- recording him, it really made a big difference to Transformer in particular, and Audio Dog. So he, Bruce has had a great progression of his solo career post Kiss. Um, you know, each one of these albums has progressively gotten better, and I hope this isn't the best we can expect from Bruce, and that he uh, he does another album of a similar format. You know, get these get these guest singers in. Um, you know, I, I think it benefits the the music uh, for him not to sing on as many tracks as maybe he did on Transformer. So another kind of release of recent years um just want to touch on quickly vinnie vincent ah. <laughs> torture um and you know I'm trying to think of some of these albums just to quickly talk about is uh, uh volume one archives lonnie did you even buy this or no if, i didn't even buy it i've you, the one seventy-one minute track of uh, guitar noodling. You you not man enough to take that? No thanks. No thank. <laughs> no thank you. Seventy-one minutes of Vinny just doodling. No thank you. Wait, what? Who? It, it, it sounds like a joke. Really? Se- really? Is it me? Seventy-one minutes. It's it's not me, is it? <laughs> That's ridiculous. You know, it, it takes a, a really ballsy person to put out uh, an album, number one of this quality, because a lot of the sonic quality is absolute shite. Um, there no two two ways to explain it. Um, and then to not even track it. I mean, I, I tried to break it up into what seemed to be the component parts for the discography. Um, you know, Shred 1, solo. Shred 2, with drums and bass. Shred 3, solo. You know, so that that's your first 18 minutes. Speedball one, speedball two, you know someone's doing too many speedballs, uh, and then it culminates with a live one of the live versions. I was offended and insulted by this release. You know when Guitars from Hell is a completed album by all accounts, uh, and I don't care if it is completed by the stuff that circulates as demos or recordings. For Vinny to put this piece of garbage out. I can only hope that it wasn't Vinny, so unforced his signature, and that it has nothing to do with him, because it really is dreadful. So, Peter Chris, you do not have the worst post-kiss solo album. <laughs> we have a winner. Sean? Um, I don't think I've ever heard of that. Um, is Guitars from Hell the EP? Uh, no, that was uh, Euphoria, and okay. the uh, also called the EP. Two different versions came out, but... 
Guitars from Hell was the uh, album he was recording in 1990 for Enigma Records, and they went bankrupt, or he shopped it to other labels on their dime, and it disappeared. Um, some of the tracks were later allegedly revisited for Euphoria, which was released in, what, 1996. Um, but, I mean, you know, we've been kept from hearing such stellar songs from Guitars from Hell, like Cock Teaser and, you know, Sl Sl Slay the Dragon. I, I don't even, even want to go there. Um, the Vinny fans will know way more about that. So, I'd say that's probably a pretty good sample of the post-kiss stuff. Uh, Eric Carr, Recology, you know, that's... Yeah, he's no longer with us, so I guess we take what we can get uh, yeah. when that comes out. They recently put out, uh, well, 2011 now, Unfinished Business, yeah, which had some really good moments on it. Some head scratchers, but you get Dial L for Love, um, and that and that's about it really on there. No one's messing with you, the demo for Little Caesar. Mm-hmm. Uh, let's, yeah. wrap, let's wrap this up with thoughts of the future, though. What, what would you like to see? Um, from any of the members of the band, um, or what do you hope for as you know we're reaching the golden years early, Lonnie? Um, I'd like to see Gene put out this, put out more more tracks like he did. Um, that was on that lunchbox version of Sex Money Kiss. Put out that that box set. I mean, it didn't have to be the box set that he's talked about for the last twelve years, but put out some of those demos like that, just put out like a collection of those in some kind of format, even if it's not, you know, a CD release, if you just want to put it on iTunes or something like that, put out a collection of, of demos. I think that would be, I would, I would eat that up. And I think a lot of Kiss fans would too. Um, Stop putting them on releases like Love Gun Deluxe, D Gene. Exactly. Kiss but, only songs for Kiss releases. Yeah, I, w I would love to see a collection of those to finally see the light of day after been being talked about forever. Um, I'd like to see I'd like to see Ace do another Ace album, not the covers album, which I'm, you know, I'm looking forward to it. But I want I don't know because just the way the other two covers recent in recent years kind of failed to hit the mark. I'm I'd rather just get an Ace Frehley album from him, Paul. I don't know, with Paul's, the shape of Paul's voice right now, I don't know if we can really expect to hear a Paul Stanley solo album or what it would be like, or I don't I don't see Paul doing a solo tour going out and singing 20 songs or even 15 songs by himself every night on a, on a solo tour. But that'd be, I don't, I don't, I don't see that happening now, but, and Bruce, I'd like to see another album from Bruce. Like I said, I really enjoyed BK3 and I, I would, I would eat up another album from Bruce in the same manner that, that BK3 was with a lot of different singers and so you know, get, Eric, get Eric on a track, get Karami on a track or two. That'd be fantastic. And, and I wish Peter would do something that could be a final stamp on his musical career to give us something better than what One for All was, would be my hope for that. Yep. Don't let that be the bookend to his career. Sean, what would you like to see or hear? Um, I'd be open to um, something with Bruce, whether it be a, a fourth solo album or something with Union or ESP. Uh, something with Bruce would be really good. Um, I am looking forward to uh, the Ace Covers album. So, and I could take or leave another like original solo album from him. Um, I would like Peter to do another album just to see if he could do something that would, I think, better suit his skill set than One For All did. Um, yeah, I don't know if I want Gene to do another album just because I don't know if he would actually, how much effort he would put into it, or if we would get something similar to Asshole again. And I, like Monty, I don't want uh, a Paul album just mainly due to the vocal issues. Yeah, and that, that's a, kind of where my perspective is. Um, I'm not worried about, you know, what he may do. But I heard yesterday, uh, I was reading Blabbermouth, and there's um, a collaboration between Def Leppard's Phil Cullen and a Delta blues singer coming out. I would love Gene to do a lounge album. 
<laughs> and and set him and set himself up with a lounge residency in Vegas, you know, just for a week. Like in a white suit. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, um, something different. You know, it could come across as sleazy for Gene and and be somewhat easy. You know, a cover of Lounge Classics by Gene Simmons. Uh, you know, would just you know, it would work, maybe. Or or it'd be entertaining at least. It'd be entertaining. I'll give you that. Yeah. Um Ace, I I'm looking forward to the covers album, but I would much rather see him do a band project album um rather than the studio creations with Pro Tools. Um uh, he's done a great job with Anomaly and Space Invader, but I like you know, if he's working with Richie again, I'd really like to see him use that foil um of the guitar attack that Richie brings to the table. And also use him more vocally. So, you know, I, I don't want to say re revisit Trouble Walking um, when Richie returned to the band, obviously, but do a, a kind of a similar format to that. Peter, you know, I, I said it in the other episode about him, get that rock album finished. Do not let um, One For All be the bookend to your career musically. But, you know... It, and again, as I said then, if breast cancer is going to be the bookend to your career, I can live with that. But I like to hear him rock out because I love Peter's voice. Um, it'd be nice to hear it. Bruce, same as you guys. You know, it's it's do the same similar thing again. And Vinny, since he's out there selling his guitars on a website at the moment, uh, he's got an auction and he's got lyrics. Let's have your box set. You've got iTunes. You don't have to actually physically release product, Vinny. You don't have to actually ship product, Vinny. You can just stick it up on iTunes and collect the money. So you can price it how you want. So I would really like to hear Vinny's box set much more than Gene's. Um, Gene, you know, we've heard so much, but I would like to maybe hear some of that box set stuff. Paul? Unless he can fix the voice or do something with it, um, don't try and do something because it, it's it's not worth it. So if he, if he's not able to go into the studio and and, and do something, and he's got to have people be honest with him, um, and you know don't 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 worry about getting kicked out of the circle by saying Paul oh, that doesn't sound good. You know don't don't finish it with a, a release that's substandard as much as he may want to. So. Solo albums. I think that's we've reached the end. Any last thoughts? Oh wait, those were our last thoughts. Okay, <laughs> that's the end. Um, thank you everyone for joining us today. Lonnie, St. Louis Kiss, and Sean, Hooligans Holiday. Thank you both for joining, and enjoy the show. We will see you again soon. Thank you. Thank you everyone. Thank you.